Hi, thank you for joining us for exercise on prescription. My name is Phoebe James and I'm a professional development officer with the Primary Health Network. Before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are all meeting on today and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. I just wanted to mention before we start that this session is being recorded. The recording and the PDF slides will become available on the PHN website in the Education Library in the next few days. We are having Q&A at the end of this presentation, so feel free to put your questions in the box and we'll endeavour to get to all of them. There will also be an evaluation at the end of the session and it's very important that it's completed. Tonight presenting, we have Dr. Michelle Redford, Ryan McCarthy, and Dr. Marie Shea, which is very, very exciting. Um, Dr. Michelle Redford is starting us off tonight, so I'll hand over to her now. Thanks very much, Phoebe, for that lovely welcome. And I would like to just start by acknowledging that I'm on the traditional lands of the Awapakal people and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And thanks to the PHN for giving me the opportunity to talk about something other than COVID this time round. And today we're going to be talking about social prescribing. So um, I have several roles, um, but my main one is that I'm a GP in New Lambton. I'm also a um, GP advisor to Hunting New England Central Coast PHN and um, a health and wellbeing ambassador for Parkrun Australia. And so that will become um, clear why I'm talking about that a little bit later on. So social prescribing, why are we talking about social prescribing? Well, I'm going to talk a bit about that in a second, but this is the brief overview. I'm going to give you a higher level overview of social prescribing. I'm going to give you the specific example of parkrun practices. Ryan's going to talk to us about um, why exercise is important and how we can help. And um, Marie is going to talk about her own amazing project that she's done in her community. So those are just the um, goals there. So social prescribing is a bit of a hot topic because it appears in Australia's primary healthcare 10 year plan, which may or may not be a document that you're familiar with, um, but this is it. It means it's firmly on the agenda. Um, and that PHNs are being tasked potentially with developing their social prescribing planning over the next few years. So what is social prescribing? Now, I'm just aware that a lot of people who are here um, are probably already on board with social prescribing and also lots of primary care health workers are already social prescribing, whether they call it that or not. Um, and it does have other names such as community referral. But these are, this is a um, definition from the World Health Organization. And I suppose it has several elements. One element is that um, prescribing a non-clinical service to um, a person with a healthcare issue to improve their health and well-being. The idea is that this process can help to address underlying um, causes of people's health and well-being instead of just treating the symptoms. And Another element is that it is a more holistic approach and potentially also develops community resource. So I suppose we're all familiar with the concept that we might prescribe medication to treat somebody's illness, but we don't always have very clear solutions to some of the things that contribute to those people becoming unwell in the first place. So what does it what are some examples of social prescribing? So the typical sort of examples, and um, Marie's going to go through this in more detail with some more detailed examples, but things like physical activity or um, hobbies or development of skills. And I suppose the key thing about all of these things is that it might start off as a particular activity or a particular group and people go for that activity or group, but they stay for the connection that that group or activity brings because we're social animals and we all need connection. So some core principles of social prescribing, this comes from NHS England and just um, acknowledging that social prescribing is very much embedded now in um, the English NHS, also in the other devolved nations of the UK, but particularly in England. And those are the sorts of core principles, which again, probably is quite familiar 
um, but some key things are about activation of people and to play a more active part in their care and that idea of developing community assets. So it is more than just signposting, you know, it is more than saying to somebody, I think you'd benefit from going to the men's shed. It's just a bit beyond that. So, um, so this is my, my own thoughts about what the steps are in social prescribing. This isn't, you know, peer reviewed or anything. It's just kind of off the top of my head. But starting with identifying somebody's needs and goals and then developing a tailored plan for that and then making the social prescription or referral and then that key step of reviewing and assessing. So very much like any sort of clinical um, medicine that we do, you know, you've identified that someone has high blood pressure, you develop a plan, you start them on a medication and then you review them and assess, reassess. I think if you're um, making a social prescription to address a particular issue, then the process is very similar. So why would we bother with social prescribing? Well, social prescribing has the potential to address the social determinants of health. And this is a bit about what I was talking about earlier about how sometimes, you know, we know that there are major contributing factors to why someone's unwell, but we can feel fairly powerless to intervene. And, you know, if somebody is living in sub-quality housing and it's mouldy, then that may have an impact on their health and so might their lack of employment and their socioeconomic status. So some of those things obviously are more amenable to policy intervention maybe than healthcare worker intervention. But there are some things that we can do and so I don't think we should um, give up. Um, I'm just going to move on from social determinants of health to this slide about health inequity. And again, I'm sure we're quite familiar with a lot of this, but just a reminder that the 20% of Australians living in the lowest socioeconomic areas are, live three years less than um, people living in the most affluent areas. And this is an ongoing gap um, that contributes to people's health. So one thing that we can do some things about is loneliness and social isolation. This is common stuff. Um, up to one in two adults feeling lonely at least one day a week. And social isolation, differing from loneliness, which if people are interested in the differences, I can take questions and answers on that. But social isolation is a risk factor for premature mortality of the same sort of magnitude as high blood pressure, smoking or obesity. And you think of the amount of time we spend trying to deal with those risk factors to um, help people to live longer and how much time we spend dealing with loneliness. Um, there is a bit of a disparity there. Um, so, oh, sorry, social isolation, I should be clear about the definitions. And loneliness also has adverse outcomes and both social isolation and loneliness have increased due to COVID-19. There is evidence from various places around the world that it has become more prevalent. And as we probably again are aware, it has a disproportionate impact on older people and those who are living already with underlying comorbidities. So Hunter New England has its own health pathway on social isolation and loneliness, which I think Dr. Marie was um, instrumental in pulling together and it's, and it's actually a great resource and that's the link there, it's just a screenshot from it. Um, that's that. And then in the Central Coast, they do also have um, a pathway about social supports, but not the same loneliness pathway. This is the physical inactivity data, just to highlight that 55% of adults didn't meet the physical activity guidelines in 2017-18, that's across Australia, but in RPHN, the proportion is even higher. So although we think of ourselves perhaps as a physically active nation, we're not as physically active as we may seem. So both loneliness social and socialization and physical activity, I think are things that we can deal with in primary care. We can try and make a plan to address these and social prescribing is one way of doing that. Where do we find out what things are available? Well, health pathways, of course. And so this is a screenshot from the Hunter New England, self, Hunter New England Health Pathway. 
but there are also these national resources like Ask Izzy, which is actually a really um, user-friendly interface. It's an app um, where you can find various things, you know, not-for-profits and things near you. And this is an ongoing issue of knowing what's available and how to refer and what's suitable for and all of that. And I think, you know, those issues haven't fully been resolved, but they are under investigation and people are working on those sorts of things at the moment. And then that's the social prescribing support um, pathway and information from the Central Coast Health Pathway. So that's my kind of overview. I am happy to take questions at the end, but I'm just going to talk about a specific example of social prescribing, and that is Parkrun. So as you can see, this is a Parkrun course. I'm not quite sure exactly where it is, and there are lots of people walking. And this is one of my key points about Parkrun is that although it has run in the name, Parkrun is actually for anyone who would like to volunteer or come along and walk and walking is an end in itself. So what is Parkrun? So this is an outline of what Parkrun is. It's a not-for-profit organizes free five kilometer walking and running events every Saturday morning in more than 450 locations around Australia. And it's been in Australia for the past 11 years. And they're, they're also starting these two kilometer events called Junior Park Runs, which runs on a Sunday morning for four to 14 year olds. It's free, it's run by volunteer teams. It's not a race, there's no time limit. You can walk, jog, run, volunteer, spectate, and it's run under a COVID safe framework. So if you haven't ever known anything about Parkrun, that's your brief introduction. And it's not really, I really think it's not really about the running. This is me and my friend Isabel at Cairns Parkrun a couple of weekends ago where we managed to persuade a whole load of delegates from the, um, health, from the Lifestyle Medicine Conference to come and join us. Um, but the Things about Parkrun as a health and well-being intervention are that really it's never too late to start moving, that connection is important as an antidote to loneliness and social isolation, that the least active among us have got the most to gain from starting to move. And I think the reason that I'm sort of showcasing Parkrun is that as GPs and other healthcare professionals, we see a lot of people who have a lot to gain from moving more. And if we can harness that moment in the consultation when people are ready to make a change, maybe we can help them to move more. And Parkrun's one way of doing that. It's not the only way, of course, but um, it's, it is a useful way of doing that. Average times are getting longer in Australia, which is a great thing and is celebrated by Parkrun um, because it means we've got more walkers. And yeah, that thing about walking is an end in itself. As well as all that, Parkrun funds the Parkrun Research Board, which is um, busily um, gathering information and analyzing it. And these are some of the papers. This is one that demonstrates that um, volunteering is, an, again, is an end in itself and that people get health benefits from, they report health benefits from volunteering. And even though they didn't go planning to um, improve their physical health up to a quarter, also felt they had benefits to their physical health from volunteering. And then this is about um, the reach, really, of Parkrun, that um, a lot of people who had been, um, who had previously been inactive, so nine out of 10 people who had previously been inactive reported increases their physical activity, and it was more substantial effect from people who were from the most socioeconomically deprived areas. So that just demonstrates again that, you know, we, if you can find those people, and we do see people every day who are um, experiencing, you know, adverse effects from social determinants of health, then perhaps you can do something about it. So this is the Parkrun Practice Initiative. This is something that I'm part of as it's a partnership between the RACGP and Parkrun Australia. 
And the idea is to get practices involved and individual GPs involved in prescribing parkrun. So the way I see this fit is within a motivational interviewing framework. Like I said before, you're doing an assessment of people's needs and their goals. Um, and then, you know, potentially to consider prescribing parkrun, either volunteering, walking, running, whatever. And before we prescribe anything, I guess we need to have an understanding of how that thing works. So if you're prescribing metformin or any, or any other drug, you need to know its side effects and you know how you take it and all of that. I think with parkrun, you need to understand, you know, who's going to go, you know, is the person going to take someone with them? Where do they have to go? How are they going to get there? When is it? You can find your local parkrun on um, the Parkrun Australia website. There's a map. I'll show you a bit of a shot of that later. And, you know, when it is. So most of them are at 8am, but some of them are at 7am. And people just need to register once on the Parkrun website. Print or save their barcode. And there's a little example of that, what that looks like up there. And then turn up maybe 10 or 15 minutes before the start time, because at every park run, there's a first timers welcome every single week where a volunteer runs people through like what to expect, what the course is like and where the toilets are and stuff like that. You get your results by email and no one comes last. And the other part of all of this, which is kind of refers back to what I was saying before, is that if you have prescribed park runs, said to somebody go and try out park run and this is how it works then I would suggest they also need some follow up afterwards just to see how it's gone, troubleshoot, you know, did they go, what happened, you know, will they go again, all of that. Um, and that's a little, this is a little shot that join in the fun at Park Run, that's a, um, that's something you can actually print out if you wanted to print it out. You can also help them to register and print out a barcode that might be advanced prescribing of Park Run. So this is, not quite exactly the hunting New England Central Coast footprint because I've got a bit of the North Coast in there, but um, this is a map of lots of park runs that we have. We're really, really blessed with lots of park runs, you know, um, across the region and that's the list there. So hopefully there is one within reach. And this is the website, the Park Run Practices Initiative. So the idea with this is that if you are keen on prescribing park run as a practice that you can sign up to become a park run practice. It's a voluntary, um, well, it's really a voluntary partnership between the local GP practice and the local parkrun event. So the idea is that you would say, yeah, we want to be a parkrun practice. This is something we think is something we want to get behind and um, spread the word. And we would encourage you to go along one Saturday morning to meet your local parkrun team and say, look, you know, this is something we're interested in doing, we want to be a parkrun practice. And then you can hop online and register your practice. It only takes about five minutes. And we don't have any massive obligations for the practice or the park run. It's really um, about relationships and so that you can understand what you are prescribing to your patients. So um, that's all it is. There's no ex expectation you will always go along with your patients or that you will start your own park run or anything else like that. It's really just a, um, a voluntary thing, a relationship thing. So that's the website. And I would encourage anyone to join up. We are a park run practice and very proud to be. Um, if you do sign up, then you can use the resources, you know, you have like, you know, the stuff on your social media or whatever. And this is a little map of the parkrun practices that we've got around Australia so far. So we only launched pretty recently, just a couple of months ago. And um, already there's a good number of people um, joined up and um, we're always happy to see more. And um, that's just some resources that we've got. And then this is just my links for some further information, but happy to take um, questions at the end. And that's it for me. And I'm gonna hand over to Ryan. Excellent. Excellent. Hopefully we can all see that. Excellent. Thank you very much, Michelle. I think uh, just on top of that, in regards to prescribing parkrun, 
I believe it'd be much, much easier to prescribe Parkrun if you've actually been before as well. It's going to be hard to describe it and describe yeah, everything about it if you've never actually been there before. So I think a great action for everyone on here, if you haven't been to Parkrun, then just attend one. It's going to be a whole lot easier to tell someone about it and explain it if you've, uh, if you've been to one as well. So following on from Michelle, I'm going to be talking a little bit more on uh, the assessing the physical activity levels and a bit more on exercise physiology as well. So just a little bit about myself. I am the director and exercise physiologist at Hunter Rehabilitation and Health. We're an exercise physiology clinic based in Waratah. Um, I've put in brackets here, self-proclaimed most passionate exercise physiologist in Australia and the 2018 Australian Exercise Physiologist of the Year. And I've popped in a little picture of me doing parkrun as well. I'm a big advocate for parkrun and you'll see me there either at Newcastle or Lake Macquarie every Saturday morning uh, jogging around. So before I get started, I just wanted to share my core purpose and the core purpose of Hunter Rehab and Health. And this means a lot to me that my core purpose is to educate and empower all humans to move more and live better. Um, I think as humans, we should all have some sort of core purpose or a greater cause that we're working towards. And um, it's one of the reasons why I'm here tonight. It, it, this falls within my core purpose of educating and empowering humans to move more and live, live better. So hopefully everyone on uh, the webinar tonight understands or knows what an exercise physiologist is, but just thought I'd refresh it if anyone doesn't know. So the actual definition of uh, an exercise physiologist are uh, that we are university qualified allied health professionals equipped with the knowledge, the skills and the competencies to design, deliver and evaluate safe and effective exercise interventions for people with acute, subacute or chronic medical conditions, injuries or disabilities. A bit of a mouthful but that is the definition in a nutshell of an exercise physiologist. So today, or well, tonight's focus, I want to just break it down into three key areas. The problem, um, the research that's out there at the moment, and the practical implications. Um, I always love to do presentations that will leave some key action points or some practical implications at the end. So you actually get something out of the presentation and you're, you're leaving with something you can implement uh, as of tomorrow. So as Michelle touched on, uh, the problem is that physical activity is one of the largest uh, risk factors for premature mortality and so is social isolation and, and loneliness. But why are we not treating it like other risk factors? So what do we do for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high blood glucose? We treat it. However, physical inactivity is still largely left untreated, whereas it does have the same impact on premature mortality. So that is the problem we're looking to address here in Australia and our PHN. These are the same statistics that Michelle brought up. Um, so once again, I'll, I'll um, focus on these again, more than half. So 55% of adults do not meet the physical activity guidelines and it's even higher here in our, our PHN. Um, there's also only 2% of teenagers aged 13 to 17 meet the guidelines. So the problem. So I ran this report on the Medicare website. You can run these reports for Medicare item numbers here. So this was quite interesting to me. I ran this just a few weeks ago and found um, yeah, some interesting data here. So this was a report run two weeks ago for the last financial year. And it was to do with the chronic disease management um, or those Medicare EPC sessions and, and how many were processed in that state for that item number. So I've popped down the professions on the left-hand side, the allied health professions. We've got exercise physiology, physiotherapy, podiatry, and chiro. And we can see there just purely in that first column, New South Wales alone, there was 75,000 um, items processed or consultations for exercise physiology out of a total of 2 million. So that only equates to about 3%. 3% uh, of all chronic disease management plan sessions are to an exercise physiologist. Now, um, I think this is a major, major problem and it needs to be addressed um, as soon as possible. I honestly think that for there are a place for physio, podiatry and chiropractic, but for chronic disease management, we're talking about obesity, uh, hypertension, uh, diabetes, cancer, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, chronic back pain, 
These are what we're talking about on these chronic disease management plans. And we know for those conditions just mentioned then that the evidence is there, strong evidence to suggest that exercise is the best treatment for these conditions, um, for treating not only managing them, but the cause of the conditions and potentially uh, helping people get off medications. So we can see there is a huge underutilization of exercise um, and exercise physiologists within, within Australia. Um, now I understand there are barriers here where a lot of these sessions are, um, these decisions are patient led, the patient might want to go to the podiatrist or the chiropractor. Um, I, I do feel this is purely because they don't know what an exercise physiologist is. They're not gonna to choose to go to one um, if they've never been to one before. So that's where um, we as primary health can, uh, professionals can help educate them around that and obviously push them in, in the right direction and, and provide that education for them. concern that addressing physical activity will take too long, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to. This is usually the barrier um, that I, I hear a lot from a lot of GPs that it will take too long in those consultations to talk about physical activity. But I wanted to break it down really simple today uh, or tonight on this presentation. And I want everyone on, the, on this presentation right now to just ask yourself, how many days per week do you engage in moderate or higher intensity physical activities like a brisk walk? I'll just give you five seconds to think about that. On average, how many days per week do you engage in that? Now, the second question is on those days, how many minutes do you engage in that activity at that level? I'll give you another five, five, 10 seconds to think about that. So hopefully we've all got a number now of how many days and how many minutes. And then we simply multiply those numbers to see if we meet the Australian physical activity guidelines of 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per week. Now, I'd love to ask how long did that take and did it make you reflect on your physical activity habits? It took about 45 seconds to do that, about the same time it would take to, to measure someone's blood pressure. Now, we know that we can do that in 45 seconds and it did make us reflect, it made me reflect on my physical activity habits. I thought about it and I had to think about it um, but it did make me reflect whether I was above or below um, those guidelines. So in line with that, um, in 2016, the Canadian Medical Association passed a resolution supporting the inclusion of physical activity questions within the vital signs section of the electronic medical records. And this was trialled first in British Columbia. So data from the 2017 Canadian Community Health Survey revealed that in Canada, 57.4% of adults self-reported meeting the national guidelines, whereas in British Columbia, that percentage was significantly higher, 64.9%. And this was purely as a result of including those physical activity questions. So we now know that those two physical activity questions on the previous slide are an example of a validated exercise history screening tool that is quick and simple to use. So when systematically asked in all patient encounters and entered into the patient's records, it's been shown to be effective increasing physical activity levels. So that's, that's very important. When systematically asked in all patient encounters, it's been shown to be effective. So a large study which, with almost 1.8 million patients found that promoting the systemat systematic collection of these questions in the electronic medical records, they were able to identify physical activity in history in the charts of 86% of patients in just 18 months. So with a really good implement, implementation here, we could have something similar where 86% of patients have their physical activity levels in minutes sitting there in their charts. Um, and by simply asking these questions, we can begin to have an impact. So physical activity seems to have a dose response effect. So increasing physical activity even by 10 minutes per day results in a substantial improvement in mortality and morbidity. And this effect is greatest when targeting those who are sedentary. So I think it's important, I could go down a rabbit hole around exercise prescription and, and how to go around that, but very important that we do have the guidelines there, 150 minutes, but very important that we don't use that as a goal. Um, there are recent studies that come out that it might be unachievable for a sedentary patient. If some, someone was coming to me an exercise physiologist and they were completely sedentary, I wouldn't sit with them in a goal setting session and try and get them to 150 minutes. 
I've found a lot of the times it's unachievable um, in the short term. So for someone sedentary, I would get them moving 10 minutes per day. That would be my goal, whether that be walking or doing an activity that they enjoy, it would be focusing on 10 minutes per day and setting smaller goals um, and helping them keep accountable and that follow up like Michelle mentioned is extremely important as well. So I think as GPs and nurses, if someone is sedentary, we are setting those very small goals and it could even be, I want you to attend park run um, at least two or three times before next time I see you and then checking in with them next time, keeping them accountable to that. So making sure that we are setting those realistic and achievable goals. So just another study that was done uh, here in Newcastle in 2017 uh, on the daily step count and the need for hospital care in the subsequent years in a community-based sample of older, older Australians. So um, some of you might've seen the study before, uh, but it was roughly around 10,000 participants here in Newcastle. They're all over the age of 55 years of age. And they show a direct correlation between steps per day and days spent in hospital. Very simple. Um, very clear correlation there. You can see the graph on the left-hand side, steps per day and days spent in hospital. So that's where my core purpose comes in, move more, live better. It's, it's simple, if you move more, you spend less days in hospital. So going into this study and breaking it down, I like numbers a little bit. So um, the numbers stated in this study that it currently costs the government $1,900 per day for a bed in hospital. Um, there's currently 7 million Australians over the age of 55. And the 25th percentile of this study was 4,300 steps per day. So 25th percentile was 4,300 steps per day for this age group. So if we help only half of this 25% achieve greater than 8,800 steps, it would result in the government saving $600 million, close to $600 million per year through less hospital days. So the results of that means that it's statistically significant reduction in the number of hospital dead days associated with higher step counts. So the difference between 4,500 steps per day and 8,800 steps per day was 0.36 bed days per person per year. So in conclusion, more active people required less hospital care and an achievable extra 4,300 steps per day would result in an average of one less day in hospital for each three years of life. So hopefully um, keep up with those numbers, but we wanna be pushing uh, our patients more to that 8,000 steps per day. And that's another great tool for exercise prescription that is simple and time efficient is, is helping your patients understand their steps per day. Every iPhone, um, calculate steps per day, whether they know it or not. It's in the health app in your iPhone. Uh, we've got Fitbits, we've got smart watches, we've got um, $5 pedometers from Kmart that can measure steps per day. So this is another thing that can help your patients and keep them accountable. You could be setting some small goals. If someone comes to you and they're roughly doing 4,000 steps per day and you're seeing them once a month, I'd set the goal for them to do 5,000 steps per day and get them to uh, make a record of it and present that to you back at the next consultation um, to help keep them accountable there. And we can work gradually to that, that greater goal of 8,000 steps. So lastly, just before we move on, I wanted to talk really about uh, a two, 2021 meta-analysis that was done in Japan. And it showed that only 30 minutes per week of strength training was associated with a 10 to 20% lower risk of all cause mortality. Now, adding aerobic training was associated with a 40% lower risk, so doubling the effect. And that's why everyone needs strength and aerobic training. So, measuring steps per day is excellent and park run is excellent, but to double the effect, we need to get that strength training in there as well. And that's where an exercise physiologist can assist with a resistance based program for that person, uh, only 30 minutes per week. So, I always like to say strength training should be part of someone's retirement plan. People are planning about their, their superannuation, their pension. Um, they should be thinking about their strength training. How are they gonna maintain their muscle? Because we do know there's a medical condition called sarcopenia where the muscle wastes away um, after the age of 50 years of age. So it should be part of someone's retirement plan is their strength training. How are they gonna maintain it? It's very important. Um, last slide here is the exact same slide I put in here, just to reference the importance of this number. 
I'm extremely passionate about this, this number and really increasing it. And I constantly do presentations to primary care professionals to improve this number. And I believe that um, I think we're all on the same page here, My, Michelle, Marie and myself are looking to hopefully improve this number and increase physical activity here in Australia. So I wanted to hopefully look at this number in 12 months time and see improvement along the way. So practical implications, the four things here. So the two questions that need to be asked are how many days a week do you engage in moderate or vigorous physical activity and how many minutes on those days do you engage in that activity and then record the physical activity in minutes per week into the patient notes or the records and review this each and every visit. If we can all start doing this, we can start to make a significant change in the health of Australians. And I'm not sure exactly what the practice software looks like in best practice or Genie or whatever software um, the GP practice is using, but I'd love to work closely with them to, to figure out a, a smoother uh, way in, in recording all that to make it as easy as possible. And then a simple guide is if they're below 150 minutes per week, refer to Park Run, uh, refer to an exercise physiologist for goal setting and a plan. And the last thing is take the pressure off yourself about trying to convince them and trying to change, change them. Um, that's what we do as exercise physiologists. We are experts in behavior change and building rapport and goal setting. And that's what we pride ourselves on. So that's what we want to do. Um, sometimes a lot of barriers we get from um, primary healthcare professionals is I couldn't convince them. Well, it, it necessarily isn't your job to convince them. It's your job to get them to someone to convince them. So um, take the pressure off yourself there and, and let um, the experts try and do the, the behavior change part of it all. But that's the end of the presentation. Here's my contact details if anyone wanted to reach out or have any questions, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation. there okay hello <laughs> sorry about that technical problems <clears throat> hi my name is dr marie shea and i'm in the port stevens area um, coming from the land of the war am i and um, i'm going to tell you a story today about tilligary connect um, i'm really excited to be here and this is a, a topic i'm really passionate about the social prescribing and the community aspect of our of our GP um, care of our patients, and um, so thank you, Michelle, for inviting me. I have been to a park run. I was invited to come to one about five or six years ago by one of my colleagues, and um, Mia. And Mia said. And finally, one day, I. Uh, just two months ago actually i used that barcode went to fingal bay and did the park run and it was so much fun so i highly recommend you all try the park run and i'm definitely not a runner i'm not like a big exerciser so I encourage you if you even if you're not a big exerciser to do that um so this is the tilligary creek which is the um uh, part of the tilligary peninsula the tilligary peninsula um 
is made up of um, five towns and um, it's a beautiful town. So I want to paint a picture of this town for you. Um, let's see, so I'm going to go to my next slide if I can. Let's see, play, slideshow, okay. So there's Salt Ash, Oyster Cove, Tanopa Bay, Malibula, and Lemon Tree Passage. And that picture I just showed you is the um, end of Lemon Tree Passage where there's a creek that leads to a bay. Um, it's a beautiful peninsula with um, incredible nature and incredible people. There are over 6,000 people in that peninsula. And we're down this isolated kind of two-lane road, about 50 kilometers from all these centers of community health, including Raymond Terrace, Nelson Bay, um, um, and the nearby areas. We're a little bit lower socioeconomic status than places like Nelson Bay. Um, and when you come down the road, you won't notice very much, but you might see the Coles and the shopping mall. And there's a, a couple other little shopping areas um, in Lemon Tree Passage with some cafes and restaurants. Um, but in this peninsula and amongst the people are a lot of hidden resources. There are people, groups, and services that I had no idea were there when I first came. So I came to this peninsula um, from the United States to be near my sons who had come to Australia and didn't want to come back to the U.S. Um, as an international medical graduate, I had no idea about this community or Australian healthcare. And at first, I was so excited to see um, that I could see patients without worrying about um, money so much. And I had, didn't have to ask if they had insurance or if they could afford a medication or test. Um, I was really loving it. Are you today, Jenny? And Jenny said, "Well, I haven't killed a Chinaman, and I don't know. You can't see me on this thing, but uh, you saw me at the beginning, and I'm Chinese. So I thought, oh my God, I took it kind of personally. But I realized now that I could have just laughed and said, oh, I haven't killed an Australian yet, um, and she would have laughed, and it would have been. It's all good. It's just uh, just don't take ourselves too seriously, kind of atmosphere in our little community, and." Um, so after a few years, though, at working in this clinic, I noticed that uh, patients were coming to see me um, every month or so because they were socially isolated. They might have had mental health challenges or chronic pain, and um, they had problems that weren't seeming to be amenable to medication or referral to psychologists or allied health. And I have to admit, I'm one of those people that probably doesn't use exercise physiology as much, so I'm definitely going to refer more to um, exercise physiology after hearing Ryan's talk. So um, basically, I, I realized that there was a problem uh, with um, uh, the community in terms of uh, in my uh, my role as a GP. What could I do better? And I came upon this uh, this project in the UK called Health Connections Mendip, and uh, it's kind of one of those social prescribing um, projects that's gotten started in the UK. And this has been happening for a really long time. In um, around the world, that's in Australia too. And the community development workers all know about it. It's called asset-based community development. And basically what that means is, a, um, the, is to, to map the services in the groups of the area and the community to help connect people to groups and services. And that's what this UK program did. And it was headed by a local GP. And it was to train the community um, and also to be community connectors and to signpost the services and also befriend each other and connect to each other and also have health connectors in the clinics to signpost patients to these groups. Um, and as Michelle said, the NHS has put millions of pounds into social prescribing and um, it's uh, reduced healthcare costs, as Michelle said, the burdens of chronic illness, social isolation um, and loneliness. And, that's been shown by research. And I called one of my former colleagues who's living in the UK now to ask her, how is it really working? And she said, it's working great. Um, so it, it sounds like the UK has really got um, a, a finger on the pulse and it's doing the work. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I was inspired by Health Connections Mendip um, to start a program like that in Tilligary in 2019. And I started talking to people and um, I, I found a community development worker uh, who was with the Port Stevens Council, and he knew right away knew what I was trying to do. And he so he put me in contact with these other groups in the community, and that included the Smith family, the Tom Marie Neighborhood Center, 
um, Tomaree's the other peninsula that's where Nelson Bay is, the Tilligary Community Association with the wonderful Fran Corner, who I was told, if you want to get something done in Tilligary, you have to meet Fran Corner. She gets things done. The Port Stevens Family and Neighborhood Services, um, which is in Raymond Terrace, but has offshoots in Tilligary. It was called the Tilligary Family Network and the Center for Hope. And, and also the Caring for Art Port Stevens Youth Jupiter, which is a youth counseling service. So we all started to meet in the church, um, and the churches and pastors. We all started to meet once a month or so to talk about what we could do for Tilligary and how we could um, combine our, you know, our manpower and our skills to make Tilligary a better place. Um, and this service kind of got uh, this this group kind of got this uh, project off the ground. <clears throat> and in addition, I met with other people in the community. Um, like a health economist uh, who's my neighbor actually who helped me to write this latest grant that I got <clears throat> and community activists like Katrina Clark who's been um, instrumental now in helping this project get off the ground. I also talked to the Tilligary Lions group and some of the other groups in town like the Country Women's Association and the Tilligary Habitat which is a group that's been helping to um, improve the local uh, um, habitat and for koalas and for the people. I've also met with um, the local physiotherapist group and uh, the local GP groups in our area. We used to have a kind of adversarial relationship where we were like, we want to have our patients and our patients aren't, we're not going to share them. But it was really instrumental for me to, to meet these other GP clinics and understand what they were going through. And also just to say we're all in this kind of same boat together. Um, <clears throat> I've also partnered with the Primary Health Network, and I, um, as Michelle said, helped to write that social lonely, uh, isolation and loneliness pathway, and that was my first introduction into the PHN. And so that's kind of where I've gotten most of this, the, mo the, the hardest thing to do is to get all these partnerships, and that was also the most enjoyable in some ways that I got to meet all these people and understand our community better. So. Um, what I've done so far with Tilligary Connect in the last three years is to meet with all those partners and to get help from them and to get an understanding of the community and what it needs. I have mapped the area in terms of groups and services by buying the website from Health Connections Bendip and entering the data. My son is a web developer, so he's really helped a lot with that too. Um, and I've gotten the word out about the website and project with flyers, newspaper articles, meetings, words of mouth, word of mouth um, in the clinic itself, telling people about it. And um, after applying for five grants, I finally had success in getting a grant with the PHN. Um, the other five grants were with different people, but I think they each taught me something about what I could do better the next time. And um, this time I got success, I think, partly from partnering with the health economist and my, my neighbor, and Katrina, who's been really helpful to help do the, especially the Excel spreadsheets, which I'm terrible at. Um, so the PHN grant was to make a printed directory um, of the services and the trained health and community connectors. So that's our next steps um, in this project. So I want to tell you now about a patient who uh, benefited from this social prescribing and how that worked with, um, with her. So Anne was in her early 70s when I first met her and caring with, uh, for her 80-year-old partner um, who had dementia and eventually went to an aged care facility. Anne was, um, had a lot of care stress and social isolation. She was drinking a bottle of wine a day, and she had gained a bunch of weight and had knee pain and, um, and uh, shoulder pain and, and depressed mood. And she rejected a psychologist referral, and she didn't really have any social group she belonged to, and she lacked connection in the community. So this is Anne after we did all the social prescribing. You can see how happy and good she looks. She's a, a classy lady, really wonderful woman. So this is what we did with Anne. We, um, I met with her once a month or so, and we would do um, talk about how she was going and, um, and do some motivational interviewing. I referred her to the Tilligary Widows Group, which is a group of women that meets once a week on Friday for lunch. And these women um, uh, welcome any women to come in. It doesn't have to be a widow. It could be a single woman. It could be a married woman who just wants to um, meet people. Um, and they just meet in different places for lunch every Friday very um, low-key. Um, I've also talked to Anne about her neighbors and to engage with her neighbors better, uh, which really benefited her in the long run. And she enjoys her neighbors, and she was able to get one of her neighbors to dog sit her dog so she could go off and do some little trips. <clears throat> we also referred her to the VIEW Club, 
which stands for Voice, Interest, Education for Women, and they raise money for the Smith family. And they also get educational lectures every month. Um, there's, she also joined the Garden Club, and she got a dog <clears throat> and walks her dog every day now. Dogs are great for exercise. Um, <clears throat> she stopped drinking just on her own. She lost 13 kilograms, and I shouldn't say on her own. She probably stopped drinking because she had all this social connection. She had lost 13 kilograms. She, her knee and shoulder pain all reduced, and her mental health was so much better. She didn't need to take antidepressants. And instead of seeing me every month, she's now seeing me every three to six months. So uh, what can you do in, in, your, um, in your clinic? Um, I think the main thing is to listen to patients. Write down things that they're doing and the groups they belong to. Maybe start to write them down and catalog them in some format so that you can share them with your other patients and with the GPs in your clinic, maybe. I think really recognizing the power of community to, to heal and motivate and encourage connection. Um, and think of social prescription as a powerful tool that can change you and your patients' lives. It's changed my life. So in the process of social prescribing, I prescribed one of my patients dancing, and she said she wanted to tap dance. And I said, well, if you find the tap dance class, I'll join you. Well, she found one, and I started tap dancing with her. And I loved it. I had a really good time and learned how to tap dance. And the other thing I did is I learned, um, I learned how to do a little bit more facilitation with the smart recovery groups, and I've joined that as well, um, as well as facilitating it. And I realized what a, um, what a, a work addiction I have. So the smart recovery is a, an addiction kind of help group that um, that we have in, in the Tilligary that started as a result of this Tilligary Connect project. Um, so yeah, just encouraging you to get out there and do some social prescribing. I think you probably all do it already, but just recognize the thing that you're doing it and do it for yourself too. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Marie and Ryan. That's fantastic. Wonderful to hear about the work that you're both doing. Um, and um, we have not got a whole load of questions in the chat, but in the questions box. But if people want to pop any questions in there, then we'd be happy to answer them. I just had one question appear, which was about whether allied health can become parkrun practices. And the answer to that from parkrun at the moment is not right now um it's really just gps it's based on the uk model um which was just with gp practices and acknowledging that um uk general practice and australian general practice and primary care are really quite different beasts but um we needed to start somewhere so it's starting with gps and maybe and then maybe we'll be looking at um allied health and things later on so that was my answer to that um Marie, what, what were the major barriers that you found in starting this project? I mean, it sounds like you've got a very long way on kind of love and fresh air. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. I can't hear you, sorry. Mm -hmm. You've got a very long way without any funding and just for the love of it. Muted. There we Eva, go. can you un oh there, there I go thank you um <clears throat> yeah it was really difficult at first um I didn't know anything about starting a project like this this is like something completely new so um the funding was difficult and getting the word out and trying to explain to people what I was doing those were the I think those are the major barriers um it's not a simple thing it's like this idea of connecting the community to all these services and to map them I don't think people thought too, what am I doing that as a GP? That's not my job as a GP. So those are kind of some of the major barriers was getting over the, what are you doing this for? And, you know, what is it? And then getting the funding, yeah, and the support and the volunteers, but it's all coming together. It's taken three years, but it's kind of, you know, gradually come together and it's been fun. I really enjoyed it. It's like a joy. I have this work addiction, but to me, when I work on this project, it feels like I'm just having such a great time with it. It's just fun. And of course, there are different models of social prescribing kind of being proposed. You know, there's all this talk about link workers or case workers or um, care navigators or whatever. But I think, you know, as primary care health professionals, we can do some social prescribing without involving those people, maybe more 
complex cases might need something more involved. I mean, is that would that fit with your experience or is that quite different? Yeah, there's so many different ways, like you said, they can um, access these social prescribing services. So I think the community actually is the most important one. And we keep, I think we we neglect to, to look at that. We look at our allied health or, um, you know, our, um, our GPs, our practice nurses, and the practice nurses are fabulous. That's one of the key areas where I think we need to, to have this um, kind of social prescribing um, education in. Um, so, yeah, I think that uh, it can happen on so many levels, the community, the allied health, uh, and uh, the GPs, the practice nurses, and uh, I think it just is, it's can surround our patients and ourselves with this wonderful, um, um, you know, a, a kind of motivational and supportive kind of atmosphere. Um, I think if we all tapped into that, we would just feel like how much, I mean, I think sometimes we measure wealth in terms of money, but wealth is also what we have around us and the amazing resources that are here. And um, Ryan, I really um, enjoyed your, like, your tip about um, recording activity and um, you know making that point of asking if if people would like to see I could share my screen with best practice and how you physically do that is that worth doing should I should I do that we I've do we that. do have two questions just while oh have they popped up sorry yeah. yep no that's all right um so um Marie um Lee Kong has asked has there been much additional time added to the consultation when you take this approach? No, um, you know, it's just part of the consultation. I just asked people, like I just did it today. I asked somebody and I said, well, do you have any social connections? And they said, no. And I said, oh, well, let's try some. And I showed her the website and I would pick three things out. I wrote them down, the numbers, and I gave them to her. I think it took five minutes to do that. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Quick. Um, uh, another question that's come through is um, hit training better than a brisk walk. Any thoughts about that? Uh, I can answer that one. Um, it's dependent on the person and what your goals are, but I think, um, yeah, I wouldn't dive straight into hit training for a sedentary patient at all. Um, but each their own. I think our goal should be getting people moving rather than what's better than any, anything else. Uh, we can get some amazing benefits from a brisk walk and hit training. It just depends about what your goals and what you're looking for. So it's going to be very individualised to the person. Okay, I will very quickly show how to use this best practice thing. If you can see my screen, mm -hmm. is that working? Yes. Yep, so up here in clinical, there's a thing called physical activity prescription. So you can't directly code it unless you go into this module and then you can record, you know, how um, how they're going. So maybe they're inactive and you're recommending, as um, Ryan said, gentle walking for 10 minutes um, every day and then it will actually print it. Um, and you need to put a little review date on because follow-up's important, like we talked about, and it prints it. So I'm not going to physically print it now, but that will then um, code it as well. But you can't code the activity level um, unless you actually go into that module in best practice. I'm not completely clear how it works in medical director though, um, but that's it in, in best practice. And that's where, the audit data like Penn CS extracts the physical activity information from. So that's that. Did that all work okay? Yeah, no, you did yeah. very, very well. All right, well, we're a little bit early. Um, unless you guys wanted to, oh, we just had a question come through. Um, this is again from Lee Fong. Sounds like a brilliant idea um, to do a park run before you recommend it. Um, and to join the tap dancing class with your patient. For shy patients in particular, the latter approach may well be necessary. And that's amazing giving to amazingly to have done that. But it seems there may be personal resources issues. Everyone's busy, yeah. time limits. We, yeah, that. we can't take all of our patients to every activity all the time, but we can model these behaviours. And so, you know, um, I think certainly from a parkrun perspective, I'm modelling going to parkrun 
very often um or every saturday morning and if you miss this saturday it's all right there's always next saturday so um i think we can share that with our patients you know um and walk the walk and talk the talk so of course um, but no we don't have to take them all with us all the time of course. all right well um thank you uh dr michelle Dr. Marie Shang and Ryan McCarthy for your time tonight. Um, great presentation, really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who has logged on and joined us. Um, please do your evaluation after this. It's um, really beneficial for us to get that feedback from you. And I hope you all have a good night. All right, bye. Thanks very much. <laughs>